Hello and welcome to the Political History of the United States, Episode 2.16, The Campaign of 1676. Last time, when we left off, we had finished discussing the campaign in 1675. In the first six months of the war, we have seen the English largely execute an incompetent war plan and miss several opportunities to at least potentially shorten the conflict. This manifests at times as failures by the English to pursue Medicom when they had the chance, and at other times it shows the English making baffling decisions in their tactics during the war, such as what we saw at Bloody Brook or at Springfield. However, the English had ended the year on a high note, after claiming a victory in the Great Swamp Fight against the Narragansett. This week, we are going to go and just pick right back up where we left off and dive into the campaign of 1676. Well, the war would technically not actually end until 1678, major combat is going to wrap up during 1676. Before we move forward, however, let's talk about one figure that we really haven't spent much time on. You may have all noticed that last week we barely talked about Philip himself. This brings up an interesting point that is worthy of some discussion. We are obviously talking about an event known as King Philip's War, and sure enough, one expects that Philip would be a pretty key figure in that war. Without question, Philip is indeed a key figure in the war, and he does much to help bring the other tribes together. However, it is important to realize that despite the fact that the tribes have allied themselves with Philip, it would not be correct to really think of the tribes as a unified force. Many of the tribes that were allied were only allied in the aspect that they were fighting against a mutual enemy in the English. The Narragansett, for example, were not terribly interested in helping Philip any more than they were in allying themselves with the English. The Narragansett joined the war not because they deeply believed in the cause of the Wampanoag and Philip, but rather because the English had become an ever-increasing risk to their sovereignty. The real enemy in 1675 was unchecked English expansion and land pressures being put on the various tribes. The alliances formed, therefore, were loose at best, as many of these tribes that now found themselves fighting against the English had just as much animosity towards each other as they did the English enemy. The unification was more of a matter of the tribes all fighting a common enemy rather than any love for Philip or the Wampanoag. Following the victory in the Great Swamp Fight, fighting largely died down as winter took over in New England. Both the English and the Indians needed some time to lick their wounds and regroup in time for the spring campaign season. The war would kick back into action during early March. The first major engagement of 1676 came at a place where the story in New England began, Plymouth. Located a few miles outside of the main settlement was the house of William Clark. The men of the house were notably absent at the time, attending a meeting in nearby Plymouth, discussing the war. It was there, however, at William Clark's house, that Philip would begin his 1676 campaign. The ensuing ambush on the house would see it and its fields burn to the ground. It would also leave 11 women and children dead. While the attack on Plymouth made use of the popular hit-and-run tactics that we have seen going on so far, the colonists obviously needed to respond. The response came with an army being sent out to pursue the group that had attacked Plymouth, under the command of a Captain Michael Pierce. Pierce set out with 60 troops from Plymouth, as well as 20 members of the Wampanoag tribe, who had decided to remain allied with the colonists. And now, as a quick side note, I do want to mention, as I've not mentioned it before, that there were a number of natives who had previously converted to Christianity. Well, some of these Indians would take the chance to rebel against the English, a number of them remained loyal and actually fought alongside the colonists against fellow members of their tribes. This explains why there were still Wampanoag fighting with Plymouth. Pierce would manage to catch up with the Narragansett warriors who were suspected of the assault on Plymouth. Reaching them on March 26, what would follow is one of the darkest moments for the colonists in the entire war. Now, before we move on here to what is going to be another mistake by the colonial troops, I want to discuss something that has become something of a reoccurring theme during King Philip's War so far. As I'm sure you've noticed, the colonists just keep making the wrong decision and paying dearly for it. I think, therefore, it is important to consider why the colonists are seemingly so bad at this. The men fighting this war are not English regulars. 
These are not trained soldiers who fought in England. This is a disorganized militia being led by men who have little to no military experience themselves. The English in New England are carrying out a war without any guidance or assistance from the home islands. New England is alone in this fight. This lack of experience goes a long way towards explaining why the colonists keep making baffling decisions. The colonists weren't fighting the war like skilled soldiers because they weren't. Keep this fact in mind as it is going to go a long way towards explaining the legacy of King Philip's War, a subject that we are going to talk much more about later. Knowing this is going to help explain what is about to happen to Captain Pierce and his men. When Pierce and his men were just north of Pawtucket, Rhode Island, they made contact with a small group of Narragansett warriors on March 25th. The battle that day was relatively short, with neither side really seeing much in the way of damage. Likely feeling pretty good about not being slaughtered, the next day, March 26, Pierce and his men went out to cover the final distance down to Pawtucket. On the way south, Pierce came across a handful of injured Indians. Without stopping to ask important questions such as, who are these men, who injured them, and what potential pitfalls would there be from following them, Pierce decided to strike. Ordering his men to pursue the injured men, Pierce had unknowingly just condemned his men to death. As it turned out, the injured men were really not that injured and indeed expected that the English would take the bait. The men fringing injury led the English into an ambush. Of the 60 English men who were led into the woods that day, only nine would survive the initial engagement. Of those nine, it appears that they had all been captured as well. All of the standard attempts to sugarcoat the massacre were made. The colonists claimed that they kept the fight up for hours and hey, they killed way more Indians. However, the real answer here is that the English lost, and they lost badly. It was nothing short of an absolute rout. A handful of the Indians who had been fighting with the English managed to escape, generally by pretending to be members of the attacking Narragansett tribe. As for the nine survivors of the battle, these nine men all ended up in modern-day Cumberland, where they too would die. There are a whole lot of stories that attempt to explain how the men ended up in Cumberland, most of them telling about nine heroic men fighting against the odds. However, more likely the men were probably captured and executed in Cumberland. Either way, of the 60 men who had originally set out with Captain Pierce, all of them were now dead. This massacre has become known to history as the Nine Men's Misery. With the English having been thoroughly routed, the Narragansett warriors made their way south to Providence. In the months since the war began, the population of Providence had significantly shrank as the war drew ever closer. With the Narragansett now approaching, the safety of Providence was clearly in question. While most of the residents of Providence had fled, their most prominent resident, Roger Williams, remained. It has been a while since we last hung out with Roger Williams. However, as a quick reminder, Williams held strong, if not radical, beliefs about Native American rights. We spent episode 1.23 exclusively with Williams. Beyond his religious beliefs not making him any friends, he also held beliefs regarding land ownership that would not endear him to his fellow colonists. The prevailing theory in the colonies was that the key to land ownership was improving the land. This is something that didn't really work out largely for the nomadic Indian tribes. Therefore, by applying English law, there was a ton of totally uninhabited land up for grabs. Roger Williams, however, disagreed with this. Williams viewed the land that was occupied by the Indians as being rightfully their land. It should not come with much surprise that, for the colonists living in New England, this was not a popular view. Sure enough, Despite being a popular figure upon arrival in Massachusetts, Williams quickly found himself on the outs, though that was largely due to his beliefs on religion. After being told that his welcome in Boston was at an end, Williams would relocate to Plymouth. While in Plymouth, he espoused his beliefs on land ownership. This did a great job of helping Williams again wear out his welcome, and he was quickly booted from Plymouth. 
This is all part of the story of how Williams, now an outcast, would end up founding the Rhode Island settlement. This also explains how Rhode Island would become an early home for various dissenters and outsiders. If you were a misfit in the 17th century New England, you probably were going to end up living in Rhode Island. Beyond making him deeply unpopular amongst his fellow colonists, this belief of land ownership did make Williams a very popular Englishman amongst the various tribes. He was one of the few voices that was advocating for their rights. And sure enough, in the days after his banishment from Massachusetts, we would see Indian tribes shelter Williams. Drain those early days of tensions in King Philip's War. Williams, now an old man, took up a role of being a diplomat attempting to keep the peace. Williams mainly focused on trying to ensure that the Narragansett would remain neutral. Roger Williams was therefore an obvious ambassador. He had been a trading partner of the Indians for years. Initially, at least, the negotiations appeared to be going well. The Narragansett gave assurances to Williams that they had no interest in getting involved in anything that Philip was doing. Williams would write to John Winthrop Jr., the governor of Connecticut and the son of Williams' longtime rival John Winthrop, of the seemingly successful early discussions. This all occurring before the English would head in there with their more heavy-handed tactics towards the Narragansett. However, as 1675 moved forward, Williams would have obviously become painfully aware of how tenuous the situation really was. As we have talked about, villages and towns all throughout New England were being burned. Colonists were being killed. Despite Williams holding out hope that things would remain peaceful, Williams had begun to realize that this probably was not going to work out. Finally, on December 18th, Williams would write to Winthrop that there was not going to be peace. This came just a few days after the Great Swamp Fight had brought the Narragansetts officially out of their neutrality and into the fight. Williams, seeing the writing on the wall, sent his family to the island of Aquidneck, where many of the Rhode Island colonists were now taking up as refugees. Roger Williams himself, either out of stubbornness or possibly hoping that he could save Providence from the coming Indian onslaught, stayed behind. Now 72 years old, Williams would remain in Providence long enough to see the Narragansett enter into the city on March 29, 1676. Williams would watch as Providence became the latest town to be destroyed in the war. Among the buildings that Williams would watch burn was his own house. The destruction of his home left Williams all but destitute. Despite having had such a long and complicated history in Massachusetts, Williams was finally now permitted to return to the place where his journey began all those years ago. Williams would relocate to Boston, provided that he kept his opinions to himself. Williams was so broke by this point that he had to request paper from the governor of Massachusetts. Williams would, ultimately, end up back in Providence following the war. For us, however, this is the final time that Roger Williams is going to make an appearance in this podcast, as he would die just a few years after these events in 1683. So with that, a big tip of the hat to Roger Williams. What nobody knew at the time was that the tide of the entire war was about to shift. Thus far, the Indians really had carried the day. It feels like I have spent the past episode and a half telling you the same story over and over again. The Indians launch an assault on a town, kill some English, burn the town, and escape before the English could do much about it. That, combined with poor colonial tactics, pretty much spells out the war thus far. Sure, the colonists claimed a victory in the Great Swamp Fight, but all that really got them for their troubles was an even angrier Narragansett tribe entering into the war ready for revenge. Though not necessarily a Pyrrhic victory, it was not a whole lot better. The tides would begin to shift some six weeks after the burning of Providence. The colonists to this point have largely been fighting a defensive war. Now, it can be debated if that was actually by plan or by necessity. However, as of the early spring of 1676, there had been little in the way of an offensive war led. Captain William Turner a Boston tailor prior to the war, had, like so many others, found himself discontented with the conduct of the war to date. Specifically, Turner complained of a well-known Indian village in Peskyumskut. Here, numerous natives lived and were allowed to just go about their lives. 
With so many colonial villages now in smoldering ruins, the English were anxious to repay the favor. Turner approached the Massachusetts General Court and requested permission to lead a force down to Peskyumpskid and sack the village. The village was inhabited largely by the elderly, women, and children. However, Turner justified the raid by saying that he didn't want the Indians to be able to fortify themselves come summer. Beyond that, the warriors from the village had been raiding, though not necessarily burning, nearby English towns. Exhausted and desperately wanting a win, the Massachusetts court approved the plan. Now, if you're wondering why the English had not already attacked the village, it's not because of some high-minded feeling about attacking a group made up largely of women and children. Rather, it was believed that there were several colonial hostages being held inside the village. This would make sense. For the Indians holding English hostages in a village did about as much as could be hoped for in order to stave off an ambush. However, by this point, the English were desperate and decided to march on. That is, despite the fact that the Connecticut colony ultimately balked at the mission. Turner would gather up a force of approximately 150 men and set forth towards the encampment. Arriving on May 19th, the English forces managed to take a hill right outside of the village without anybody really noticing their presence. With the village still asleep, Turner launched his attack. Immediately, chaos broke out throughout the village. The attack came with devastating speed and efficiency. Turner's men shot the Indians as they left their wigwams. Others died while attempting to escape the now besieged village. As has so often been the story in this war, though typically the other way around, the English set fire to the village. With the ambush complete, Turner suddenly had a problem on his hands. The Indians were now fighting back. Colonists were dying, and nobody was having a very good time anymore. It was time to get out of Dodge. Unfortunately, what followed was an unorganized retreat that saw the English begin to lose the battle. Turner himself was killed during the sloppy retreat. The fighting retreat continued to Deerfield when the English were finally able to make a stand and force the Indians off of them. As the dust settled from the battle, it became clear that this was a major English victory. Though English losses were high, of the 150 who had left on the mission, approximately a third of them were now dead. The Indians suffered far more damage. The numbers of those killed inside of the village ranged between 200 and 400. Amongst the dead, importantly, was the chief of the Narragansett, Kanoshet, who had been, seemingly unexpectedly, present in the village at the time of the attack. Capture drained the battle. Kenoshet was given the option of ending the war. In exchange, his life would be spared. Kenoshet refused the offer. He was summarily executed and his head was marched back to Hartford. Though the evidence isn't great, one must wonder what would have happened if Kenoshet had decided to take the option of surrender. It seems pretty unlikely that the English were going to have let him walk away alive in that situation either. Despite the steep cost for the English, Peskyumpskit was their first clear victory in a major engagement in a very long time. The Narragansett tribe had just suffered a very serious loss, and now also had to navigate without their leader, something that would significantly weaken them moving forward. What the English did not know at this point is that their victory here would mark one of the major turning points in the overall war. It is a popular belief amongst many modern historians that, Despite the colonists doing everything they could to lose this war, it was always over before it began. The colonists had the advantage in weapons, armor, and tactics. The Indians did have great success with their hit-and-run style, however, it was never going to cause enough damage to actually win the war. The English had a sizable population, so we are no longer dealing with a situation like early Jamestown, where a hundred or so colonists were facing off against 15 to 20,000 members of the Powhatan Confederacy. The English had the manpower to stand on their own at this point. Let's not forget either at this point that the Indian tribes were largely nomadic and seldom carried with them large stores of food. While farming didn't stop during the war for the Indians, their crop yields were obviously going to be significantly reduced. The natives inside of Peskamusket were hungry. And as is, their food stores were already getting concerningly low. The English attack saw those low food stores burnt and reduced to nothing, 
In an instant, starvation went from being a serious concern to reality for so many Indians. Despite a devastating spring campaign to this point for the English, plus all those losses through the course of the prior year, it was now the Indians who were reeling. The tribes throughout the Connecticut region are going to fight on. There will be more offensive attacks from them. However, they are never going to recover from the loss at Peskyumskit, and English domination is going to become the storyline of the war in Connecticut. For his trouble of leading the attack and dying, William Turner would get a town named after him. For the first time in the war, we really do begin seeing, after this point, the weakness of the local tribes. The New England Confederation, plus Rhode Island, were a united front fighting against a common enemy. Sure, they had their differences, and all of the colonies were concerned with their sovereignty being usurped during the war. However, by and large, they did stand together. For Philip, he was in command of a much looser confederation of allies fighting against the English. We can sit around and debate if he had any overall command power over tribes like the Narragansett, who seemed to hate him only slightly less than the English in that moment. However, what was clear is that Philip lacked the organized and united front that the colonists had. With the loss at Peskyumskit, Philip had a new problem. As has been the case throughout all of history, the job of holding such a loose alliance together is made much easier by winning. Everybody wants to pick the winning side of a dispute, and as the Indians were causing so much havoc for the English, they, at least for the initial nine months of the war, were pretty much in control. The colonists were scrambling, and the Indians seemingly had the advantage. Yet, as we are going to begin to see, following the loss of Peskyumskit, Philip is now going to be given the far more daunting task of holding together a loose alliance when things are not going as well. The theme of the war is now going to begin to shift away from the English incompetence and bumbling to Philip trying to maintain a fighting front as more and more tribes decide that while winning was great and all, losing just isn't nearly as much fun and that it is time to get out while they still can. At this point, the war on the Connecticut front was largely over. Skirmishes would continue, however, the English were by and large going to continue on the offensive from this point forward in what was essentially a mop-up operation. Back up to the north of Massachusetts, however, Philip was still able to hold together a increasingly distressed force. Philip and his forces would attempt to turn the tide of the war back to their advantage in June when they launched an attack on Hadley. Last week, we had visited Hadley for the story of their great victory the year prior, a victory that many historians question the veracity of. However, there is no debate on the battle that took place on June 12, 1676, and the importance of its outcome. Now, just as a quick note, I want to remind you of events going on down in Virginia at this very moment. As New England colonists are preparing for a defining battle in Hadley, down in Virginia, Governor Berkeley is trying to track down Nathaniel Bacon in the early days of Bacon's Rebellion. I mention this because I want to make sure that you have a good picture of the events going on throughout the colonies. As of June 12, 1676, there is a still ongoing war in New England, and now Virginia was quickly descending into their own conflict. On June 12, approximately 250 warriors attempted to launch another attack, or possibly the first attack, on Hadley. What ensued was a crushing loss for the Indians and a resounding English victory. After a year of having their towns burnt, the English were successful at repulsing the Indians at Hadley with minimal losses of their own. By all accounts, the English were not expecting the attack. It had largely come as a surprise. However, the Indians themselves were surprised to find that Hadley had become well fortified. So, despite holding the surprise on the attack, the English defenses were enough to quickly turn the advantage in the battle. The loss for the Indians at Hadley was not just damaging to their war effort, but it was absolutely crushing for their morale. For many of the tribes, it became clear that when the attack on Hadley was repulsed, the war was indeed lost. That, no matter what they did, they were simply not going to be able to overcome the colonists. The Massachusetts Bay Colony, realizing that they had their enemy on the ropes and knowing that Philip's alliances were now vulnerable, 
decided to act. The Bay Colony issued a proclamation of mercy, which essentially gave several tribes a way out of the war in exchange for a more merciful treatment when the war inevitably came to an end. Numerous tribes took this deal, seeing that all was lost. Those who continued fighting were largely made up of those remaining tribes that knew that they had gone too far down the path to quit. It is worth saying that amongst those who took the offer to lay down their arms and accept English justice, many of them ended up being captured and treated as though they themselves were now prisoners of war. Ultimately, many of those who did manage to find a way to escape from English custody found that they either had to make their way out of the region entirely or were forced to seek shelter among one of the remaining neutral tribes in New England. While Philip's alliances were falling apart, the victors of Hadley pressed their advantage. Under the command of Major John Talcott, troops gave chase to the now retreating Narragansett forces. Catching up to them on July 2nd, Talcott and roughly 500 men came upon a Narragansett encampment. What followed was an absolutely brutal battle, with no mercy given. At the end of the day, nearly 200 Indians lie dead or captured. The following day, another 80 members of the Narragansett tribe, waiting in Warwick to surrender, were slaughtered by Talcott's army. The attack on Hadley would turn out to be the last major offensive engagement for the Indians in King Philip's War. Throughout the remainder of July 1676, what remained for the colonists was a mop-up campaign. The alliances that Philip had spent the better part of the summer of 1675 building were rapidly collapsing as tribes abandoned him in order to make peace. Despite, however, the functional end of the war, there was still the matter of dealing with Philip himself. As long as he was out there, there was still going to be his closest allies and the Wampanoag fighting for his now lost cause. The war could not actually end until Philip was either captured or dead. Luckily for the colonists, they were spared from a long manhunt. By early August, the hunt from Philip had reached a fever pitch. Troops under the command of Benjamin Church utilized the help of so-called praying Indians to help track down the location of Philip. Praying Indians have been in our story since the beginning. These are those Indians who had converted to Christianity and had decided to fight as English allies rather than remain neutral or fight alongside Philip. Church received information on August 11th that Philip was desperate. Even within the Wampanoag at this point, he was rapidly losing support as he was facing challenges from the inside. The information in this case came from a member of the Wampanoag who decided that it would be a good idea to get out while he still could. Beyond the information that Philip's support base was collapsing, the escaped Indian also shared the more critical information. He told Church where Philip was and where they were going. Not stopping at just giving directions, he personally led the colonists to the location. Leaving from Plymouth and marching to Bristol, Rhode Island, contact was made in the early morning hours of August 12th. Church, due in large part to the help from the Indian guide, was hoping to spring an ambush on the Indians. However, when Captain Roger Goulding basically crashed right into one of Philip's watches, shots were fired and the battle erupted. Despite the general chaos that comes with battle, Church and company were quickly able to spot their target. Philip was trying to flee. Philip would end up running directly into the ambush. According to Church, an unknown Englishman attempted to fire at close range, but his gun failed to shoot. Well, that seems like a lucky break for Philip, it really only delayed things for a brief moment. Taking place in the ambush was John Alderman. Alderman was a praying Indian and a member of the Wampanoag tribe. Well, the gun of the colonists failed, Alderman's did not. He fired a round that struck Philip square in the chest. Before he hit the ground, Philip took another round to the chest. Philip, the man who had led a bloody and violent war that per capita remains one of the deadliest in American history, fell face down into the water. Philip was dead. Philip's body was beheaded, and the head was marched back in victory to Plymouth. The head was mounted and remained up on a post for nearly ten years. While there would be skirmishes for some time to come, King Philip's war was generally over. 
The end of major combat in King Philip's War, however, is not going to be where our story on this matter ends. Next time, we are going to come back and look at the peace settlement that is going to get worked out years later in 1678. We are going to be visited from our good friend Edmund Andros, who is about to wade into New England politics, a position that is going to, over time, define his legacy in America. After that, we are going to begin looking at the legacy of the war in general and what it would all mean moving forward. With that, I hope you all have a great two weeks. I hope you are staying healthy and staying safe, and I will see you back here next time where we discuss the peace settlement and the official end of King Philip's War. <laughs>